Hello, I'm Aurora. Uh, the song's called This House is Haunted. Think this house is haunted, at least it's haunted me. Spend the day. Slamming doors and nights listening for creeps. Think of it, I can't remember last time I fell asleep. The air feels different now, viscous and heavy. Oh, oh. Spend your nights slamming doors. Spend your days walking, gliding over my creaky floors. You're not much for talking. Moaning in my hallway, lonesome figure hung with chains. Oh, oh. What secret lives on your shoulder? I'm not one to kiss and tell, but you're not getting any younger. I'll light a candle if you join me at the table. Give me 15 for tea, we'll chat if you're able. Oh. house is haunted maybe the ghost is me spend my nights slamming doors and listening for creaks to think of it i can't remember last time i fell asleep the air feels different now viscous and heavy i think this house is haunted. I think this house is haunted. I think this house is haunted. At least it's haunted me. Wolf. Thank you so much, Aurora. We look forward to hearing two more songs from you tonight. And yes, we were expecting to have Lindsay Equal Night with us today, but health issues have come up. And in these COVID times, we just roll with it. And we're especially grateful that Aurora, on short notice, was available to share her talents with us. Welcome to episode two of season four of The Last Sunday. Whether you're joining us live here in the Broadway theater where we have under 30 people to follow provincial guidelines and we're all wearing masks, so it is a bit of the eyebrow edition tonight. We just have to communicate with you in whatever way we can. Or whether you're joining us via the live stream from the comfort of your home or in one of our partner locations, we're very glad you're here. And we are streaming through YouTube this month, so please chat on the YouTube. Let us know who you are, where you are, and what you're thinking about. What a month it has been. 
three different elections, and of course, who could forget the second wave of a global pandemic? Those elections took up a lot of our time and energy, both our minds and our hearts. I know my son, my five-year-old son, was very interested in the political process. He kept track of his favorite candidates' lawn signs as they were going up around the neighborhood. Uh, he also came with me into the ballot box in the civic election, took the pencil and almost voted for the wrong candidate. But, you know, you got to learn how to check the right box sometime. And then finally, he was very interested in what's been unfolding south of the border. I explained to him we have a president who has lost the election, but is protesting losing the election. And my son, and sometimes, you know, if you're five, you have the most honest questions, making sense of the world around us, says, well, why is he doing that? And I said, good question. And he said, did he win or did he lose? And I said, he lost by millions of votes. And he said, well, then he should lose. And I said, yes, he lost. And he said, well, then he should go away. And I said, I think so too. I think so too. And he said, well, I know one thing, dad. And I said, what's that, son? And at five years old, he said, I don't want Donald Trump to be our mayor anymore. <laughs> and I had to fully agree. I don't want that either. So we're moving past that. And here we are, episode two of season four. We're happy to be here at the Broadway Theater. And at this point in the episode, we always like to give our thanks for being here on Treaty 6 land, the homeland of the Métis people. But if you've watched last Sunday before, you know I have a little bit of a beef with the way land acknowledgements have kind of become turn off your cell phones acknowledgements. They kind of get a little bit rote and people say them fast and they're out of the way. By the way, turn off your cell phones uh, out there in the live audience. But when it comes to land acknowledgements, one practice we're trying to do is integrate them through everything we do and think and feel a little bit more about what it means to acknowledge the land we're on. I have a relative who says, do we really need to have a land acknowledgement after every single, at the beginning of every single event? And I talked to him about my feeling that if we actually place ourselves in the moment, and feel what it means to acknowledge the land that we're on, then it might serve us to understand the history of the land that we're on and the truth of that history, and sit in the discomfort of that history, of what's happened on this land, as a way to propel us into a better future. Because no matter where we came from, whether we're indigenous to this land, whether a newcomer, whether we're a settler, we all want the best future possible. And so I encourage you to think and feel a little bit what it's like to be on this land and to understand what that truth is and how great the understanding of that can propel us into a better future. We're grateful to be in relationship this year at the last Sunday with different theater companies from around our province. We have the Battleford's Community Players in Battleford. We have the Lyric Theater in Swift Current, Spark Theater in Prince Albert, and some theater, Regina, just down the 11 in Regina. We're gonna check in with some theater in Regina in a second, but I wanna acknowledge that this month, Spark Theater in Prince Albert is not able to join us. And from the Lyric, we've had a lovely message from artistic and executive director, Gordon McCall, who has told us that since March, their theater has actually been shut down due to COVID. So they're not permitted to have gatherings. However, they're grateful to be involved through the live stream link. And they sent us some very nice words of support encouraging us to keep doing what we're doing, and they're glad to be involved in the way they are. So thank you to our partners. And let's go now to some theater in Regina, Judy Wenzel. Let's hear from Judy about what's going on in what's Regina on in this Regina? month. Hey, Judy, are you there? Yes. Hey, Judy, are you there? Hey, Joel, I am here, but I can't see you anymore. The camera has panned to a, an empty microphone <laughs> and not on not to you. Rest this assured, I look that I'd really, love really good, Judy. Don't worry. Just, just, just put a picture in your mind. I'm wearing a sweet shirt, and I'm feeling good in my new jeans. Oh, there you are again. Hi. Hey. Hi, hi, hi. How's your month been, Judy? Uh, it's uh, it's been it's been a wild one. Can I get a little more volume there, Tyler? Thank you. Uh, it's been a wild one down here in Regina. 
uh, as you said, we ourselves had a had a municipal election here in the city. And what were the results of that election? We've heard a little bit through election. the news, but uh, any surprises? So there were there were some surprises that have us have us like cautiously optimistic here in Regina. Like we like we're pretty uh, comfortable in our our kind of like not haveness and um, like comfortable being disappointed often with uh, our municipal politics. But this month's uh, election gave a lot to be uh, hopeful about. So on our uh, city council, we've elected five new councillors out of uh, 11, four of whom are uh, clearly uh, have progressive ideas, progressive values, and who are very loud and bold about those ideas and values. So that's very hopeful. And then the other thing is we elected the very first uh, woman to uh, be mayor here in Regina ever, Sandra Masters, who again, jury's first... still out, like we'll see what happens. Wow. And what, what is the yeah. vibe, you say jury's out, but what is the vibe about Sandra Masters? What are people saying so far in this past month? Uh, I think people uh, are, are eager to see what she does. She has, she's speaking loudly about, uh, or, you know, she's speaking louder, let's say, than our, our previous mayor about uh, climate strategy, about harm reduction uh, and poverty strategies, uh, about housing. Uh, and that is, that is hopeful to see. But again, it's like super early days. So we shall see. Absolutely. So cautious Absolutely. optimism so cautious. in Regina. Optimism. Thanks for that update, Regina. Judy, our Regina correspondent from Sum Theatre Regina. And Judy, one of the things we're doing, of course, is having the different parts of the last Sunday. If you've never tuned in for a last Sunday before, you know, those four acts. We have the music, we have a rant, a hot seat interview, and a great new 10 minute play. Judy, we're going to have one of those pieces of the pie coming to us live from Regina tonight. So why don't you introduce what that is? Yeah, so tonight we have a rant coming live from Treaty 4 at the Creative City Center here in Regina. And uh, uh, when thinking about who is a, a citizen artist, uh, thinker, maker, doer, gift giver, that would be a great person to ask to rant this month. Uh, the obvious person that came to mind was Chris Alvarez. So I am so happy to introduce Chris Alvarez with a rant, live from Treaty 4. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. You can call me Auntie Ranty tonight. That'd be fine. So some theater asked me to offer rent. And this is the description I got in the email. Quote, the subject, while at your discretion, should reflect an event, events, that has affected the community at large in the past month. And I thought, well then hold my beer because I'm gonna need both my hands. And I panicked. I thought, how can I distill this month, take everything that I've noticed that's happened, boil it down to five minutes or less? So yeah, thanks some theater, I guess, for inviting me to do that. I feel lucky enough that I get to share out loud often. And so I approached a few humans in this city asking them, and actually outside of the city, I approach a few humans who don't usually get asked to share or can't share often. And I said, is there something in your heart that's stirring or something bubbling up in your mind that you really would like to share? In three sentences, could you put that together? And a few of them responded and sent me back replies. And a few of them, well, I presume were too tired, too stressed, maybe as I was this last week, really distracted. So like putting together three sentences is, I mean, if I can't put my pants on, how can I put three sentences together? For all of them that I reached out to, I just wanna send a 
a love note to say thank you for considering and I'm wishing you rest and I'm wishing you a lot of fresh air. Four people replied. And so I'm going to share this rant for those who can't. Four messages and in between each, I'm gonna share like, I don't know, one cent of me, one, one line of a song. And that's, uh, you know, yeah, one line of a song because really my life's kind of a strange musical. Does that sound okay? You ready? Here we go. Gotta throw this paper away. Make sure that's done. The rant for those who can't. Number one, something that's been really getting my goat lately is how much the provincial government hates drug users. The overdose crisis is out of control. So many people are dying and they refuse to fund harm reduction or improve addiction services in order to save those lives. I need a hero. I'm holding up for a hero till the end of the night. Number two, here's what's been heavy on my brain. So many of the people in my neighborhood are hungry. I see individual charity and frontline staff and service organizations scrambling to help against insufficient resources in the middle of a pandemic. I wish city and provincial governments cared about this as much as they seem to care about football or hockey or money. <laughs> it's a gas. Grab that cash with both hands. Make a stash. Number three. Time's up, you fossil fuel guzzling, energy sucking, carbon spewing, cow capitalist, junk food eating, land grabbing, power hungry, nature destroying, closed minded, pandemic denying, anti mask, misogynistic, homophobic, racist, privileged white patriarchs. Yeah, you heard me. Time's up. We proclaim that our time has come. Who are we? We are electric mobilized, energy saving, carbon neutralizing, new economy, clean eating, land stewarding, consensus building, nature loving, open minded, pandemic aware, respectfully masking, women loving, gender bending, anti racist, racialized, indigenized matriarchs. Yeah, you better quake in your boots because our time has come. Come on, people now. Smile on your brother, everybody get together. Try to love one another right now. Fourth message. Say her name, Barbara Kentner. No justice, no peace for anyone. I don't have one line of a song for that. I only have love and humility. Humility reminding me that pandemic or not, I cannot exist well in this world alone without you. Without my teacher friend who silently suffers beyond her limitations, without my aging baby boomer parents who get defensive when I'm trying to casually, not so casually see if they've gone to Walmart. Without my partner who quietly listened this morning as I raged, frustrated about a gathering in Calgary of anti-maskers in their walk for freedom, where I observed mm, a lot of white able-bodied people holding signs that said things like, my body, my choice, your freedom matters. Let me breathe. Humility reminds me that I can't exist in this life without my kids. My teenagers who, in all this grayness, have so much light in their eyes, who are wise beyond their years, beyond the years of this SAS party government, beyond the years of Scott Moe, who can't seem to call a lockdown or call a circuit breaker 
But my kids can see that all the family businesses and teachers at schools and families in their homes are already in lockdown. We're already doing it. Humility reminds me that I cannot exist without the kids. I believe the children are future. Teach them well. Let them lead the way. Thank you. Let's hear it for Chris Alvarez. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for that rant, that rant for those who can't. It was wonderful musical interruptions. Uh, Chris is joining us from Creative City Center. Thanks to Creative City Center for volunteering their space and to Tyler Toppings for helping us out. Chris, tell us a little bit about what you do when you're not ranting for those who can't. Uh, oh, okay, Joel. Um, I uh, hang out with my teenager and homeschool. I um, wash my hands and scrub the toilet. I make art sometimes. And uh, luckily, in this whole time, I've still been able to create a show that's close to my heart called Bird Sienna. Can you tell us a little bit more about, about Bird Sienna? Some of our audience members, has anyone heard of Bird Sienna out there uh, here at the Broadway? We've We've got a couple of people that know Burn Sienna. For those that don't, can you tell us a little bit about Burn Sienna? Thank you. Sure. It's uh, uh, you know, pre-March 15th. It's a live theater event, variety talk show, uh, where I, inspired by my growing up here as a brown kid, I wanted to reach out and share what that was like and also to hear from other people what it's like for them. And so it's, uh, it's a lot more color in this variety talk show. And I, um, I like to serve up lots of humor and delicious food. And so in the last few months, I've been really lucky because I've been able to continue on video and share a video format or a video offering of Burnt Sienna, which is really, really making me feel happy to keep doing. We will uh, make sure we tweet we will, that link sure. out to our audiences, Chris, so maybe some of our audience can join you if they haven't heard of Burnt Sienna before. But before we leave you for right now, you've told me before the story of the name Burnt Sienna. Would you be willing to share where that came from? Sure, sure. When I was five years old in kindergarten, our teacher asked us to draw our family and brought along the Crayola box of 64 crayons built in sharpener and and gave me the uh, flesh colored crayon which is a, a you know it's kind of a pink salmon color um it didn't really suit my uh, decisions of what i wanted to draw for my family so i looked back in the box and and found brown and didn't really care for that but then i saw this other one next to the gold and the silver was burnt sienna or in the 70s it was called indian red I, it's a, kind of a landmark for me of when I first realized I was brown. Wow, thanks for share, sharing that story, Chris, wow, and thanks, thanks again for sharing, for sharing, sharing your heart with us tonight and on Burnt Sienna. We look forward to keeping in touch. Another round of applause for Chris Alvarez. Yeah. Thanks for those, thanks to thanks those people who have been commenting on the chat. A lot of people during Chris's rant uh, from their homes commenting on our YouTube chat, saying that what Chris was saying was resonating with them. If you have questions, ideas, thoughts, things you wanna share, put it on the chat. We love you to participate. We see theater as a participatory act, not a consumer act. It's not passive. Don't just sit there, be involved, be engaged via the chat. And for those of you live here at the Broadway, of course, you know at the end of the night during our hot seat interview, we have time for questions from you for our hot seat guest. But before we do that, let's bring out Aurora Wolf for another song. Aurora. At a moment's notice today, really, truly appreciate it. No problem. Uh, I'm told by Crystal that you are from Mortlach, Saskatchewan. Yeah, but everybody knows where that is. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do my research, but why don't you share with us? Does anyone know where Mortlach is? Anybody? Anybody? Yes, front row here knows where Mortlach is. Yeah, okay, we got one. But for those uh, that don't, tell us where Mortlach is. Uh, Mortlach is by Moose Jaw, and it is uh, west of Moose Jaw, I believe. And 
I live there, there's 300 people that live there. So we're down to 299. I'm assuming. <laughs> um, and for the longest time, it was like famous for like the Mortlock fiddlers. But I think most of them had like passed away before like my mom was in elementary school. So it was like kind of a weird throwback as like a kid, like not knowing, like nobody fiddles here. Right. So the town's known for something that doesn't exist anymore. What was it like for you as a kid growing up in Mortlach? Uh, a lot of like skating. Um, like ice skating or ice like skating? skateboarding? No, no, there's like no pavement. <laughs> no pavement in Mortlach? No, no, yeah. there's some pavement. It's like, I don't, I wouldn't say it's skateboard like Mecca by any means. Mortlach, not skateboard Mecca. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. It was, you knew everybody. A lot of our like parents had grown up there, so... At the school, like my mom went to that school and all the teachers were the same, so um, they'd always call us by our parents' names. Nothing like being perpetually in the shadow of your parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, you didn't have time because we just asked you today to join us to write original songs for this episode, but you have selected some songs out of your repertoire that relate to the current events of this past month. So the, can you tell us a little bit about the first song that you played tonight and why you chose that? I picked that one because uh, I've been writing a lot during the pandemic because I have nothing else to do. I've also been spending a lot of time in my house and I live in like kind of an old house that makes a lot of weird noises. <laughs> so I always joke about how it's haunted um, and like how maybe that's just like me being in this like squeaky house more often <laughs> than I'm used to. Or maybe it's haunted. Or maybe, who knows? Right, right. One or the other. What do you have for us next? Uh, this song is called Patchwork. Um, it's about like basically just like the incredible like land colonization of like rural farming. It's all flat where I'm from and my family is farmers, but it always just makes me really sad to like see all these like grain crops and I'm like, what did that look like before it was like plowed and all the rocks were, ha were hauled out of there? And all that. Patchwork is the name of the song? Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for sharing it with us tonight. Round of applause for Patchwork by Aurora Wolf. Whew. It's been a while since I've been in front of people. Make you sad, but your children can eat grass. Great beasts roam again, painted green, yellow, and red. What once was unbroken silk is now a patchwork quilt dominated by the name your grandfather built. Your blood beats for the pulses, the bread box for the masses. You never asked, you don't want to know the truth that your hands have sewn in this graveyard. You call home. <laughs> Thanks so much.
front woman for a band here in town. We'll hear more about that before she plays her last song. The next piece of the pie for the last Sunday is, of course, the 10-minute play. We're thrilled to partner with the Saskatchewan Playwright Centre every month to help with the development of this play. This play was written specifically for this month. And we like to describe it as potentially the newest play in the world. So the actors are going to come up here in a second, but while they're coming up, we'd like to check in with another one of our partners. This season, of course, we're partnering with the Battlefords, community players. We have Donna Chalice in Battleford gathered with some fine, is it Battlefordians, Donna? Or Battlefordites? <laughs> Battlefordian, sure, why not? I just love how accepting me? you are of whatever I offer. Thank you, Battlefordians. <laughs> uh, what's your month been like? How's your month been, Donna? Well, we were in rehearsal, and like everybody else, uh, you know, the doors got shut and changes were made, but, uh, but we're all still uh, quite excited about the fact that we hope we're going to get a chance to get back on the boards after we get this spike over, but uh, it's tough for everybody. It's affecting not just the arts, not just theater, but businesses and lifestyles, uh, mental health. Um, so it's, it's a struggle, but um, you know, we're moving forward and we're continuing to look for ways in which we can keep active um, while we deal with this terrible pandemic. I love the, the dedication to getting back on the boards, Donna. And what are you rehearsing or what have you just taken a pause from rehearsing at the moment? Um, we just finished a show called The Outsider, which was very appropriate because it was about uh, uh, yeah, politicians and it took place just before all the elections. So it, worked, it went over really well. And we actually had eight performances sold out. So our patrons have been very supportive and have stuck with us. Small, small groups, but certainly very attentive and very appreciative of the safety measures and the, you know, that that we put in place so that both the actors and the audience could relax and enjoy a performance. We were in the middle of um, Love List, uh, which we were supposed to start this Monday when uh, when things got really sad, fortunately. And so that's now put on hold until February. But they're gonna continue to rehearse at least once a week. So, um, you know, we're, we're working at it. It's, uh, it's not easy, but the love of theater is uh, an amazing tool. <laughs> people just want to do and want to see. And if we can keep people safe, uh, we'll be back here in February doing another show. It's so wonderful to hear, Donna, and I, I think you put it aptly. The love of theater or the love of anything keeps us going during this very stressful yep. and difficult time. If we zoomed out from your theater company to Battleford and the Battlefords, what would you say during the past month was the, the biggest current event or the biggest issue in the Battlefords? Oh, we had the election just like everybody else, or elections, I guess. So, uh, um, you know, we have what we have. We have a new mayor and two new members of council here. Uh, we'll be watching with interest as to how they um, how they deal with things. That's in, in North Battleford, of course. In Battleford, we've got two new members of council. So that's good to see. And uh, Battleford is unique. Uh, in my opinion anyway, it has a split, three women and three men. Uh, so that certainly brings a different perspective to uh, any operation when they have, uh, uh, you know, people with sh different interests at the table. So often councils tend to be all men. <laughs> well, it's uh, high time, like we heard from Judy and Regina, we've got uh, the first uh, female mayor in Regina and nice to hear that uh, gender equity is improving around our province. Good to hear what's going on in Battleford. Donna, thanks for being with us again this month. We look forward to having one of the pieces of the pie live from Battleford in coming months. You bet, look forward to it. Awesome, round of applause for Battleford's community players for doing what they do.
the love of theater keeping them strong in Battleford. I'd now like to ask uh, Elizabeth Nepchuk and Crystal Harder to come out to the stage. They are going to read what just might be the newest play in the world by playwright Shanda Stephenson, who's given us a play this month called Just Goliath. Kim, hello. Can you hear me okay? Hi, Dr. Miller. Yep, you're coming through fine. How about me? Yep, no problems on my end. Good, good. So, how have things been going since our last session? Things have been, you know, fine, I guess. Fine. Just fine? I mean, as fine as they can be. How are things supposed to be at a time like this? A time like what? A time like the world is falling apart around us and there's nothing we can do about it? <laughs> We've talked a lot about how you feel there's nothing you can do about bad situations in your life. Let's think of some of the ways that's not true. What exactly do you feel you aren't in control of right now? I don't know. The global pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> Let's list what you can control in that situation. Wear a mask, stay home as much as I can, wash my hands, don't touch my face, blah, 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 blah. Why blah, blah, blah? Because we've been told this for months and it's not working. And I can take every precaution and be as careful as humanly possible, but there are those assholes who think this is all a joke or a conspiracy who are out there going to nightclubs or playing hockey and not masking. So no matter how careful the rest of us are, people are still gonna die. That's true, but... It's important to focus on what you can control, the precautions you can take to keep yourself and your loved ones safe. You sound like a government of Saskatchewan PSA. <laughs> Preposterously stupid announcement. Some of their rules do seem to be pretty arbitrary. <laughs> arbitrary? I know you're supposed to be objective or whatever, but I think we can all agree that it's fucking idiotic that <laughs> I can't have dinner with my family, but I can go play bingo and get drunk at the bar. As long as I do it before 10 p.m., that is, because COVID is nocturnal, you know. Do you want to talk some more about that? No, not really. Well, what do you want to talk about? I don't know. I gave you some homework at the end of our last visit. Were you able to make any progress on it? Honestly, I didn't even try. Why not? Because it felt, I don't know, pointless. How do you mean? Like it feels like there's no point in trying to improve myself when there's so much other stuff to worry about. Like what? Like staying alive. Your mental health is just as important as your physical health, don't you think? Yes, but you don't stitch up a flesh wound when somebody's flatlining. But you're not flatlining, are you? So far, you're healthy. So let's see to that flesh wound. You don't want a lifelong scar, do you? Can you leave the metaphors up to me, please? <laughs> I'm just trying to speak your language. <laughs> you still have to pay me for the hour, even if you don't talk. I'm sorry, I guess I just don't, I don't know, I don't have much to say. You were quite anxious about the election last time we met. You must be pleased about the results. I guess. You're not? No, I mean, I am. I... But it's not like Biden was a good choice, he was just the less bad choice. <laughs> and we still don't know that Trump will go peacefully without a fucking civil war. And... <laughs> I don't know. I just keep thinking about 2016 when we were all like, he can't win, he can't win. And we went to bed that night with this horrible realization that he might win. And woke up the next day and he had won. And it felt like Sam and Frodo failed to throw the one ring into the fires of Mordor. Like evil had won. The last four years have just shown us how much evil can do and how much we can lose to it. And just because a little over half the country voted for the less evil guy doesn't mean that evil goes away. 
And even if we did, it doesn't mean we can forget about it, right? I mean, I thought that a Biden win would make me feel better, but it hasn't. I don't have to think about evil every day anymore, but I'll never really get over it. Who could? Do you believe the world is all evil? Let's try that exercise where we list evidence that disproves our unhealthy beliefs. I'll go first. The frontline health workers who put their lives on the line to save people who are sick. Your turn. I can't. All the people registering as stem cell donors to try to help that baby in Manitoba. Can you think of anything? Something small, even. Oh, my neighbor shoveled my sidewalk after the big snowstorm and helped me push my car out when I got stuck. Enough of this, all right. This isn't a list of hopeful things to me. This is a list of all the ways that everything is fucked up. All your tips and tricks and exercises, they aren't working. Why not? They don't matter enough or they're too small. It's chipping away at a mountain with a chisel. This is too big. It's too much. How are we supposed to do this? Every decision we make could be life or death. And we have no idea, no way of knowing if this is the decision. This trip to the grocery store, the massage treatment, that will be the one that ends up killing us. And at work, I'm supposed to be the gatekeeper of who is safe and who isn't. And what if I'm wrong? What if I let someone in and they make us all sick? What if someone dies because of me? No one would blame you. I would. I would blame me. And the fact that I still even have to go to work makes me so angry. I'm so angry that the government decided the economy is more important than people's lives. So I'm forced to put my fucking life on the line for what? For tips? So I can pay my rent because the government has decided it won't do anything about that either. And I don't even feel safe in my own house. Like, what did I touch before I washed my hands when I got home? Did I sit down before I changed my clothes? Did I miss something that I, when I was disinfecting? Did the guy that delivers my groceries sneeze on anything while he was unloading? And if I hear one more person say that we should be using this time to work on a new skill or learn a new language, I am going to scream. I'm exhausted all the time. I can barely remember English some days, let alone learn a new language. Then there's this opposite constant message of take it easy on yourself. You're living through a terrible thing. So I try to be gentle and shut down the guilt and shame self-talk, but then I feel like I'm enabling myself or something. Like giving myself permission to take it easy is also giving myself permission to just give up. So I do. I give up. I give up taking care of myself, of reaching out to my family, and fuck do I miss my family. I've stopped brushing my teeth. Just totally quit. <laughs> and the fact that this is what I worry about makes me feel like human garbage. If black people are fighting for their lives in the States, they can't find the parents of 500 of those children kept in concentration camps at the border. People are dying every day, and I'm what? Missing my family. Sad that I can't go to the movies. Jesus Christ. Self-pity and self-loathing is so profoundly boring. <laughs> I'm so tired of the monotony of my own thoughts. But if I talk myself out of those, all I have is crippling terror. So I stick to hating myself because it's easier to be bored than terrified. So listing things I can control and finding evidence that the world isn't evil and keeping a journal of my thoughts, it doesn't help. It doesn't do anything to help me stand up to this big, terrible thing we're facing down. This isn't David and Goliath. It's just Goliath. Just stomping over everything.
Dr. Miller? Sorry, I think you're frozen. No, Kim, I'm still here. Well, say something. <laughs> You're the one who's supposed to have all the answers. I don't think I have anything more to offer you. What? Maybe you're right. Maybe this is futile. Who am I to assume I can stand up to this? I, I miss my family, too. I'm afraid to go to the grocery store. I'm taking seven different herbal supplements that are supposed to boost my immune system, and I don't even believe in herbal supplements. <laughs> Maybe you're right. Maybe we should just let ourselves off the hook. Give up trying to improve and just get through it as best we can. <laughs> no, you can't just... Wait, are you doing that, like, reverse psychology thing? Like, by convincing you that this isn't useless, I'll end up convincing myself? No. Kim, it's not that. I'll get my secretary to call you to uh, reschedule for another time. No charge for today. No, wait. Don't go. I... Can we just... Have you seen that social distance hug thing? Where you just hug yourself and, like, project it at the other person? I have. Thank you. Just Goliath by Shanda Stephenson, directed by Mackenzie Dawson, and featuring Elizabeth Nepchuk and Crystal Harder. Another round of applause for Just Goliath. And now for her third and final song of the episode, please welcome Aurora Wolf. They locked you up and threw away the key Now it's all fucked and you're walking free You got your ticket out And the world shut down Just your luck, brother, what a long face Now you're stuck between your mother and a hard place Locked in to limited space Captivities and acquired tastes Ain't no reason why Serve your sentence twice Just a goddamn victim Of a good time
There's some parallels between the situation, different space, same isolation. Surely it's right to escape sometimes. Ghosts call you back, knocking on your window. Old habits write your little love notes. It's not easy to break that spell you're working when you fell. Ain't no reason why Serve your sentence twice Just a goddamn victim Of a good time The last blizzard has blown itself out. Pussy willows begin to sprout. Brighter days are on their way. It's the little things that chase the haze away. Cigarettes and backyard birthdays. Stringing up Christmas lights to brighten up your darkest times. Ain't no reason why Serve your sentence twice Just a goddamn victim Just a goddamn victim Just a goddamn victim of a good time. Hello, Wolf. Aurora, in addition to your work as a solo performer, you also are the front woman of a, a band here in town. Yeah. Could you tell us about that? band is called Dump Babes. Dump Babes, if you want to follow Aurora. And, and why Dump Babes? Because uh, we love garbage. Um, What's not to like? Making it sexy again. <laughs> we just recorded a new single. It should be out soon. And we're working on a full-length album in the new year. Fantastic. So we will uh, make sure we tweet out to our followers information about Dump Babes. Where can we hear your music in the meantime? Uh, we're on Bandcamp. We have an EP up on there. And there will be a Vader session. Featuring us dropping soonish. <laughs> Thanks for joining. We're going to look out for you, Aurora Wolf, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks and for having folks. me. <laughs> Thanks, folks, for such the generous reception here, for coming live to the Broadway Theater, for joining on the chat. We did have a comment, actually, it was a question for Donna Chalice uh, from uh, Greg Ochitwa in Regina, wondering when bidding starts on that painting behind you, Donna. Um, it looks like it's uh, an original, um, but maybe we'll see if we can set something up uh, if, if you're willing to sell. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful work. Uh, so Greg Ochoa is looking to bid on that painting. Uh, we'll work on that for next episode. Thank you, Greg. And thanks for the others that have joined us via the chat. I would be remiss if I didn't also thank our sponsors and funders for this series. We could not make the last Sunday happen. We could not make it free of charge without the generous support of the City of Saskatoon, Sask Arts, and the Canada Council for the Arts. Those organizations are extremely important. They fund us. Round of applause for those funders. Thank you very much. <laughs> Additionally, if you tuned in last episode, you know that this fantastic network we're developing via the live stream between Battleford, Swift Current, Prince Albert, Regina, and Saskatoon is only possible, and I'm really going to use my eyebrows for gratitude on this one, is only possible due to the generous donation of Dr. David Edney through the David Edney Theatre Fund. He saw the potential in what this could do to connect us as a province of theatre makers, of people concerned about current events, 
So Dr. David Edney, I know you're watching from home again this episode. We appreciate you. Round of applause for Dr. David Edney. Thank you. This brings us to the final portion of the evening that we call the hot seat interview. We welcome a guest from our community or from one of our communities who has some expertise in current events of the month that will help us move a little further down our path of understanding, of thinking about and of feeling about what's happening in our world. And we get a wonderful amount of information a truly intense and immense amount of information from the traditional media. So what we try to do in the hot seat is go a little further in a different direction. So instead of telling you what you've already heard in the media, we're trying to expand those horizons. And this episode, we're going to hear from a philosopher, a bioethics philosopher on the bioethics of the pandemic. So I'd like a warm last Sunday welcome for Will Bushert, who's going to join me on the stage for the hot seat interview. Will is going to tell us the moral philosoph philosophical, that word is always so hard to say, perspective of a global pandemic. Welcome, Will Bushert. Thanks, Joel. Good to be aboard. Thanks for being here, Will. I know you teach uh, philosophy and political studies at uh, the University of Saskatchewan. That is true. And uh, you're a published author in academic journals and also on the editorial board of the Canadian Journal for Practical Philosophy. That's true. Does hey. that mean there is a, a journal of impractical philosophy? Alas, no, there is no journal of impractical philosophy. I um, see a niche market out there, yeah. <laughs> uh, tell me, when, when you were a kid, did you kind of have like a dream of becoming a philosopher? Well, okay, you've, uh, you've set me up for some standard jokes here. Um, <clears throat> um, when I was a kid, at a fairly early age, I was interested in philosophy. I was, I was reading philosophers partly in the way that a lot of people do, the same way that people read Russian novels, or, uh, uh, so that you can show other people on the bus what you're reading and maybe get a little bit of esteem out of it. Well, I, I did that to too. The, the Russian, like, I don't know a lot of kids that read Russian novels, actually, but, but how old are we talking here? 10, 11, 12. And what philosophers were you reading at 10, 11, 12? Oh, uh, Nietzsche for sure, Sartre. The, th the thing that attracts all young people to, that attracts a lot of young people to philosophy is the dark, brooding, depressive stuff, sure. And I was no different at that age. <laughs> but, but, but ask me the follow-up. <laughs> well, <laughs> my follow-up would be, uh, what was the moment where you decided you wanted to pursue a career investigating bioethics? Oh, okay. Uh, to be clear, that's not bioethics is part of my main research focus. Applied ethics generally is, especially related to technology. But that, as you can imagine, that inter that intersects with uh, topics related to medical practice quite a lot. So, there are people who make their whole life's work in bioethics, card carrying bioethicists. I would be remiss if I claimed that I was one of them tonight. I'm somebody who teaches bioethics and other stuff related to it. Thank you for clarifying. So you don't have the card, the bioethics card, but so when did you decide in your lifetime or what made you decide that you wanted to be an applied ethicist? Oh, uh, what made me decide to be a, a professional philosopher? I know that sounds ridiculous. A professional philosopher is basically the judgment that it beats working for a living. It beats working for a living. Um, it's, some, it's something that I was interested in anyway. It's something I was going to do anyway, whether I was paid for it or not. And it just it occurred to me that um, better to get paid for doing something that you were going to do anyway. Excellent. Well, I, I uh, did. And, and not, not uh, entirely coincidentally, um, possibly the happiest, th this really contradicts part of the play from before. Um, Possibly one of the happiest moments in my father's life was when I, just, I said, maybe I want to go to law school. And uh, he, he was overjoyed. And my, my son's going to turn out to be a success after all. And seeing his joy made me want to go to graduate school in philosophy instead. <laughs> you crushed his dream for you. <laughs> this isn't going out online or anything, is it, that you can see? <laughs> It's live stream. I, I, uh, I hope it doesn't offend anyone. Moving on to the global pandemic. Now, sure. now that we've gotten to know you a little bit. There's a segue. If, if I gave you three words from a philosophy perspective, 
philosophy of a global pandemic. What's the first three words that come to mind? Oh, you even, you even helped me prepare for this and I haven't given it m that much thought. Um, well, okay, uncertainty for one. Uncertainty because this is one of the things which makes it very difficult to think about what to believe and what to do is being characterized by uncertainty. We're in uncertain times. Um, a second word, I suppose, might be something like anxiety or panic because we've all been at this point effectively, our lives have been disrupted. We've been under stress for, what, eight or nine months at this point. And um, so it's not particularly a philosophical phenomenon, but uh, people are under a lot of stress. And um, psychologically speaking, might not be in the, might be in the, might be in a good position to see things clearly and understand things better than they might otherwise, or might be in a much worse position to understand things clearly and make decisions because we're all in, we're all in circumstances which haven't really occurred during our lifetime before. Yes. And that's maybe a good time for insight, but maybe not a bad, but maybe not a good time for making decisions about things. I see. Now we do have you here. We're, we're talking about bioethics. I understand you're not a bioethicist per se, but you do teach it. Yeah. Can, can you tell me uh, for, for the lay person, what is bioethics? Sure. This is pretty boring stuff. I mean, in, in, the, in the widest sense. Way to sell it, yourself. In the widest sense, it's just what the word suggests, right? It's uh, um, the, the branch of inquiry, especially in philosophy, that deals with what to do, what to value, concerning life in general or the life sciences. So that includes things like genetics and biology and medical practice. When people use the word, however, most often they mean it in the, the narrower sense of biomedical ethics. Right. Um, so um, physicians and medical practitioners, what should uh, the ethical guidelines be governing what they do, uh, what should be the rights of patients with respect to physicians and caregivers, and what physicians and caregivers propose for patients. So biomedical ethics is what most people understand by that term. I see. And is there uh, an example that you can give for us, sort of to picture how ethics might be at play during a pandemic? Oh, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, fortunately for me, unfortunately for the world. Uh, yeah, all kinds of them, unfortunately. Um, back when this all hit the fan, round about late March, early April, um, many of us who pay a lot of attention to the news were focused especially on the situation in Italy, right? where, especially in northern Italy, where ICUs were overflowing, kind of like happened in New York a few weeks later. There were uh, bot dead bodies stacking up in the streets. And a, one very much a bioethics question that came up, and I did some interviews about this at the time as well, the number of ventilators in this province is finite. The number of ICU beds in this province is finite. How should we be prioritizing who gets access to medical care in a pandemic situation? That's a kind of a, for better or for worse, that's sort of a classical bioethics question to ask. And um, frankly, the answers make people uncomfortable. Also, and I hope this is coming up next, <laughs> um, uh, questions about, well, ordinarily, Right. Um, many of us have some pretty strong intuitions about respecting people's freedom, respecting people's autonomy. Yes. Res and if I put it this way, it might even have extra salience. Respecting people's right to make decisions about their own life. Right. No. That's, that's like motherhood and apple pie to endorse in normal circumstances. When it comes, things, comes to things like a person's right to not wear a mask or a person's right to remain skeptical about the efficacy or safety of a potential vaccine. Those become bioethics questions. And, and so that brings me to the question of, of vaccines because they're all over the traditional media. A vaccine is coming. How do you, from a philosophical perspective, look at someone who is against vaccination, an anti-vaxxer per se? Okay, uh, here, uh, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the great disappointment to many undergraduate students who take a first course in bio, biomedical ethics, is that, well, there really seem to be basically two positions in the field. There, there, there's, more variety, it's, there's more to it than this, but it, it always comes down to a conflict between two basic positions. Morally speaking, are we trying to do good? Are we trying to maximize the amount of benefit in the world, the amount of good consequences in the world? 
Or are we trying to respect the autonomy of patients? Are we, trying to, are we seeking to morally respect people's rights to make their own decisions? A lot of the time, when it comes to things like access to medical care, there's no particularly deep conflict between those positions. As I'm, I'm pretty sure you see coming, when it comes to things like your, I'm using air quotes, right, right to not wear a mask or your right to resist um, getting a vaccine, those two positions come into conflict. <clears throat> right? There's, um, what do you say to the anti-vaxxer? May I, may I indulge for a second? Please. Set up, it's what philosophers like to do. Can I set up a case? Please. Imagine, and this is imaginary, but imagine for the sake of clarity, uh, a fourth vaccine candidate is announced tomorrow. And unlike um, the Oxford or Moderna or uh, Pfizer vaccines, it's, it's judged to be 100% effective and 100% safe. And, um, if we're trying to maximize the amount of good in the world, we're trying to right, work on what's called, what's called the principle of beneficence, of doing good in bioethics. Well, what you might say to the person who says, a patient who says to you, I don't want to get a vaccine is uh, on that principle of doing good. Is, well, if the vaccine is 100% safe and 100% effective, you're not, just mistake, you're not just mistaken about your factual views about the vaccine. You're doing something morally wrong by not getting it. Sure, uh, uh, by, by hypothesis, right, if your obligation is to maximize good for you and for other people in your community, and there's a way of preventing harm to people in your community and preventing harm to you, that view says it's not, after a certain point, right, and then remember, we're assuming 100% effective, 100% safe. Right. It's not morally optional. You have, a, you have a duty, you have an obligation to get the vaccine. Now, that's not reality, right? And the situation that we're in right now is vaccines on the drawing board of varying levels of efficacy, and people have probably very reasonable concerns about whether safety has been assessed adequately. And because research was done very quickly and the sample sizes were limited and so on. Um, you know, does that, does that, we're still sticking on the benefit side, right? right. Uh, does, that, um, does that eliminate your moral obligation to be vaccinated? Or does, it, does it just dissolve your, your worry? Well, if you're someone who has reason to be especially apprehensive about the risks of a, a vaccine, you have underlying health conditions or you're immunocompromised in some way, then okay for you, it probably does change your, you know, still sticking with the same principle, it probably does change what your moral obligation is. For you, given that in your case, the harm may exceed the good, um, possibly you should not get vaccinated or maybe more realistically, you should wait until more information comes to light. However, the other principle, and notice everyone in the room here tonight and people and all the ships at sea. <laughs> in other contexts, you'd be prepared to endorse this whole. Many of you would be prepared to endorse this wholeheartedly. Instead, what we should be doing is respecting people's rights, respecting people's autonomy. Well, notice on that side of the argument. In a sense, the facts don't really the facts don't matter very much. The principle of autonomy in biomedical ethics says that the patient's decision is the patient's decision, <clears throat> and, and provided we're talking about a competent adult who's making a decision about whether to accept medical treatment, if you, a full hardcore acceptance of the principle of autonomy says it's the patient's decision to make, and that's almost the end of the story. So right, um, what do you say to the diehard anti-vaxxer or the vaccine skeptic or the person who refuses to wear a mask in public? Um, on that, on that argument, which might otherwise be very persuasive in other contexts, probably the most that you can say is, well, don't you also have an obligation to look out for your members of your community? Don't you have also an obligation to look out to other people? But in terms of the decision about whether to get vaccinated or the decision to wear a mask, the, the uh, hard to gauge the room here. Everyone's so spread out. <laughs> um, but they're all uh, wearing masks. Yes, they are. Oh, uh, don't don't set me up for comedy on that at, at this point. Um, <laughs> if if it's if it's a if it's a tension between good and right, what's going to win? Oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, in a way, it's asking for a prophet rather than a philosopher. But um, 
I thought uh, that was in your bio as well. Uh, no, I, 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 I didn't include that in my bio this time. <laughs> I sometimes do. Uh, I'd say, well, it, look, it's, uh, it's remarkable that in the area of thought and writing and discourse, the language of autonomy and the language of rights often is presented as triumphing. In practice, and this is just me offering an opinion, but a pretty well-informed, em empirically well-informed opinion, uh, good tends to win out in practice. Is there any example of that that could give us hope in this situation? Oh, well, it's, it's, a, it's terrible comedy, and it's kind of dark and depressing, but um, people who cling to the principle of autonomy, even in the face of contrary evidence, are going to lead very short lives and leave very few descendants. Will Busher. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks to Will for taking the time to join us this evening. Thanks all of you for taking the time to join us, whether you're joining us here live at the Broadway Theater or at home in one of our partner cities. We appreciate connecting with you. We are, as you know, a registered charity here at some theater, and we could not do what we do without you. We like to keep this program and everything else we do free. But if you were moved or your thoughts were provoked, or if you saw the good of what we were trying to do this evening, please consider visiting our website and making a donation to keep what we do free for everyone across this province. That's sometheater.com. And finally, we do have a request before you leave this evening. It is an old, long-standing tradition of ours that since we did our first Theatre in the Park show, at the end of every show, we asked people to shake hands with someone they'd never met before and meet them. Now, we're going to stop that tradition um, for obvious reasons. <laughs> no more shaking hands, but it doesn't mean you can't say hi. Whether you're here uh, in person at the Broadway Theatre, you could say hello to someone from a socially distanced distance. Or if you're on the chat, you could introduce yourself and maybe strike up a conversation with someone. And what else you can help us out with is please let five people know about the last Sunday because we'd love more people to be logging on. We have the live stream option so everyone can feel comfortable and safe participating whatever way they can. If you don't invite someone or if you don't connect with someone before leaving the theater on the chat, we do keep track of you and judge you uh, harshly. Uh, so please comply with that request. We're back here next month. A lot of people have been asking, uh, when's the last Sunday in December? And just look at your calendar. It's the last Sunday in December. And we'd love to have you join us. We have episodes every last Sunday of every month all the way through May. We are some theater, and we're grateful to be bringing people together, even in these difficult times. Thanks for joining us.